So, dear all, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the second ARENA policy talk of 2020. The ARENA policy talk are a series of online events that provide that provide a forum for renewable energy policy discussions. They enable the sharing of experiences and best practice in policy design and implementation to support the efficient renewable energy deployment and maximize the benefit realized. They also aim to generate feedback from ARENA member states, policymakers, and experts to support ARENA's implementation of the work program and ensure relevance and accuracy. Today's policy talk focuses on policies to support green hydrogen, and they will be presenting the funding of our upcoming publication, Green Hydrogen, a Guide to Policymaking. The analysis aims to fill a knowledge gap between commitment and action, providing an overview of the actual measures needed to move this energy career from niche to mainstream, following the recent, recent growing interest and pledges for green hydrogen. ARENA has already published the Reaching Zero with Renewables report that consider how hard to decarbonize sectors could achieve zero emission by 2060. It also accessed the use of renewables and related technologies to achieve this, including green hydrogen. This solution is also analyzed in the joint report, Renewable Energy Policies in a Time of Transition, Eating and Cooling, in collaboration with uh, EIA IA and uh, RENT21, that will be published at the end of this month. Our forthcoming report on green hydrogen finds that to transform various commitments to reality, a number of barriers should be addressed. For example, for example, there is still almost no infrastructure for hydrogen, no marketplace, as well as no universal system to differentiate between sustainable hydrogen and hydrogen produced from coal and methane. Chief and most barriers as for many new technology is the high cost. Providing subsidies to produce green hydrogen will not be enough. Policymakers will need to set up a system that enables green hydrogen to realize its promises in the energy transition. ARENA identified four pillars for green hydrogen policymaking. This will be present in a few moments, and we think they provide a clear vision for policymakers to understand the action needed before investing in green hydrogen. An important point to understand from the onset is that green hydrogen is not just a substitute for fossil fuel, but it is one component of a mix of technologies available to decarbonize the energy sector. I think it is important that we have this discussion now. We need to be ready to capture the most value from green hydrogen, planning in advance its contribution and the policies needed to achieve it. We will also require more collaboration between the public and the private sector. Just a few days ago, during the Race to Zero event, we announced our collaboration with the World Economic Forum to increase public-private collaboration for green hydrogen. To further discuss collaboration and the additional actions needed, I will, now, I will now hand over to Doug Killen, Director of ARENA's Innovation and Technology Center, and Zabia Teruki, Directors of ARENA Knowledge, Policy, and Finance Center. Thank you all for joining us today, and I wish you a fruitful discussion. Back to you, Doug.
the, the, the focus of the discussion today, of course, is policies for green hydrogen. But um, before moving into that, we thought it would be useful to give you a little bit of background on the uh, technology and, and economics. So if we can move to the next slide. Uh, and, and it's a topic where we have been doing quite a lot of analysis in recent years. Uh, and the director general already mentioned uh, the Reaching Zero uh, report. We have an upcoming report also that discusses more in depth the uh, electrolyzers and of course the, the upcoming policy uh, report. Um, it, we, we think it's important to, to, to move from the next to the next stage towards the, the deployment of, of uh, uh, green hydrogen. And for that, we have established a collaborative framework, uh, which is uh, a an, 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 uh, uh, platform for the dialogue between governments and private sector, how to accelerate uh, green hydrogen, and uh, uh, it's it's quite a large uh, group at the moment that is that is uh, uh, has identified a number of priorities there we're currently working on. Um, we look at the supply side because that's where renewables come in, but we also look at the supply side uh, uh, at the, at the use side. So, um, and in that context, we had our innovation week in October, where this topic was also very much on the on the agenda, and we looked at the different sectors. Next one, please. Now, uh, hydrogen has been on the agenda a few times, and we think that this time is different for two reasons. First of all, the cost of renewable electricity has come down significantly. On, on the right side here, you see the cost reductions for the last decade. So that makes that now green renewable, uh, green uh, hydrogen is a viable option. So the production of hydrogen from renewable electricity. The second thing that's different is that now we're talking net zero carbon 2050. So we need solutions for sectors such as industry, such as aviation and shipping, where uh, it's difficult to work directly with electricity and uh, hydrogen can be a technical uh, solution. The, the key cost component for uh, green hydrogen is the cost of electricity. You need about 50 to 55 kilowatt hours per kilo of, of hydrogen. So, and uh, to, to put it in context, about eight kilos of hydrogen is equivalent to a gigajoule of natural gas. So we see an important role for hydrogen, but you need to look at its strengths. It's not a panacea. So you need to find efficient uh, applications uh, where it makes sense to, to use that, that hydrogen. Next slide, please. In terms of cost, uh, so to, we think that in, in this decade, the cost can come down to something like $3 per kilo of hydrogen. And that's a combination of electricity cost of uh, 20 to $30 per megawatt hour and uh, the capex for the electrolyzer of $840 per kilowatt. Both cost components can come down further than in the period thereafter. And we think you can reach below one and a half dollars per kilo in the 2040, 2050 time period. That brings down the cost of this green hydrogen below the cost of blue hydrogen. So that is an important argument why we think that the future will be dominated by green hydrogen. But we need a significant upscaling of uh, electrolyzer capacity. So today, dedicated hydrogen electrolyzer capacity worldwide is about 300 megawatt. There is a pipeline of around 60 gigawatts of electrolyzer projects. And uh, the, there is a need to have about 300 gigawatts in place by 2030 and a few thousand gigawatts by 2050. So there's an enormous upscaling needed in the coming three decades. Next slide, please. 
And with that upscaling, we see a role of hydrogen and especially green hydrogen that is significant in uh, decarbonization. So uh, we think long-term for net zero uh, uh, 2050 world that hydrogen could account for somewhere between eight and 10% of the mitigation effort. And to achieve that, the total amount of hydrogen produced needs to quadruple from today's level. So a uh, significant upscaling needed and a significant change needed in the supply uh, mix. So we need to move from gray hydrogen to what we think is, is about uh, two thirds green hydrogen and a third blue hydrogen by 2050. And now I'll hand over to Rabia. Thank you very much, Dolph. Um, so as presented by uh, Dolph, we can see that uh, green hydrogen is expected to play a major role in the energy transition. Uh, to do so, we need to address some of the barriers that it still faces. Um, among the barriers that we highlight in, uh, in the report is still the missing large dedicated infrastructure to support hydrogen in all its uh, possible end uses. And then for each of the end uses of hydrogen, some challenges remain, just to give example of the lack of demand, <clears throat> sorry, for green industrial products or uh, the, the technical barriers around the use of hydrogen and uh, green um, ammonia in shipping. Uh, chief uh, among all the barriers remains the high cost of, of, of green hydrogen and green products as mentioned uh, already. Uh, this is why uh, concrete actions are necessary to translate commitment to, uh, to, to green hydrogen and address the existing barriers. Uh, it, it's in this context that uh, we identified four pillars for green hydrogen policy making as a way to sort of better structure uh, the policy actions that are required. The first pillar focuses on setting up a national hydrogen strategy uh, uh, that will define clearly uh, the country's level of ambition for hydrogen from the onset, estimate the amount of support that is required, uh, serve uh, as a reference for, for, for the private actors in the hydrogen industry, and help ultimately attract financing. Typically, national strategies are preceded by uh, R&D program, uh, vision documents, roadmaps, etc. And since 2018, we have seen an increasing number of countries uh, 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 publishing hydrogen strategies in Europe, Latin America, Asia, etc. And many other countries are preparing their strategies uh, uh, as we speak. Uh, examples are Italy, Par Paraguay, Oman, Morocco. Uh, the preparation of a strategy creates also the opportunity to involve civil society, academia, private sector, as just mentioned, and, and really can be an opportunity to set the policy priorities, uh, which comes to the second policy pillar that we have. As you, said, you can see in this figure, green hydrogen can be utilized in a wide range of end uses. And to uh, avoid diluting efforts, policymakers should identify those applications that provide the highest value and, and, and prioritize action accordingly. Another important aspect to consider here is the principle of additionality, uh, recently raised by a number of European countries. The renewable uh, electricity used for green hydrogen production should not be diverted fr from more immediate and efficient direct uses. Once those priorities are identified, we need uh, to ensure that the hydrogen use is sustainable, since, uh, as everybody knows, the molecules of green hydrogen are identical to those of gray hydrogen, which, uh, uh, which is why we need to ensure the guarantee of origin scheme as is uh, the, which is the, the, the basis of the third pillar of policies. Such a scheme uh, should provide clear certification for hydrogen and hydrogen products, as well as increased consumer 
awareness and give the possibility for uh, to claim potential in, in incentives. It generally, guarantees of origins should account for the whole life cycle carbon emissions. Uh, it should be designed uh, to, in a way to allow policy uh, maker and end users to understand the impact of the energy carrier and ensure consistency and compatibility with the emission schemes of other commodities, allowing for comparison with other energy sources. This brings me to the fourth pillar, <clears throat> which is the adoption of enabling policies and measures to create the socioeconomic space that would allow green hydrogen to become a part of the energy system. So in, in fact, policy, policies that drive the transition must cover not only the deployment of green hydrogen, but also its integration into the broader energy system. Uh, uh, need, the, the kind of measures needed is how to account uh, for hydrogen in the energy data, industrial policies around it, et cetera. And then economy-wide economy policies that uh, affect the sustainability and the pace of the transition uh, that can create an ecosystem for green hydrogen uh, to create the industrial, economic, and social value uh, uh, that it can create, uh, including jobs, of course. Uh, the four pillars that we very briefly presented here uh, 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 will, will support green hydrogen in transitioning, as the Director General mentioned, from niche to mainstream, keeping in mind its specific roles. In fact, hydrogen uh, is one part of a wider technology portfolio and related policies to achieve the energy transition uh, together with electrification, the direct use of renewable energy and energy efficiency. As you know, IRENA's policy work includes analysis of, uh, of all renewable energy and some energy efficiency options and for example, in the next policy talk on the 30th of November, we will present the finding on the joint report with IEA and N21 on a heating and cooling policies. And, and many of you also know the, the ARENA's approach to policy analysis is based on a holistic systems-based framework where energy system is part of the broader socioeconomic structures uh, uh, upon which it is built and which, uh, with which it interacts that really allows us to estimate the social and economic benefits of the transition. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. I would like to briefly introduce you to Mr. Frank, Frank Walters, who will be moderating the session. Frank has been uh, leading renewable energy projects, uh, transactions and technology development for 30 years uh, including serving, serving as Deputy Director General of IRENA. Uh, I'm going to be very short because his, pro, his CV is super long. Uh, he served on many boards of many uh, energy companies um, and uh, currently serves as VP of Low Carbon Hydrogen at uh, Worley. And he's also the Director of the EU GCC Clean Energy uh, Technology Network and Fellow in several academic institutions. Uh, Frank, thank you very much for joining us. Yes, thanks, uh, Rabia, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to moderate this uh, this session. Uh, in addition to uh, the things you mentioned, uh, uh, we also established uh, the MENA Hydrogen Alliance this year, uh, which I think is is a relevant uh, addition to the the things that we do. is under the framework of DII Desert Energy, but uh, there was something missing in this region, uh, which also has a strong public-private partnership uh, character. Um, but with that, I would like to uh, introduce the, the panel discussion. The panelist is Johannes Bogil, who is head of uh, global public affairs at Orsted in, uh, in Denmark. We have Kirsten Westphal, senior analyst at Stiftung Wissenschaft and Politik, the Foundation for Science and, and Politics uh, in Germany, and Karl Hartmeier, who is managing director of North Sea Fuel uh, in Norway. I would like to ask them to each, uh, you know, briefly introduce themselves and provide an inspiring opening statement after which we can, uh, you know, go into uh, a more in-depth Q&A. So Kirsten, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Frank. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And my point is really that I think policies are key. We are looking into developing a global hydrogen strategy or a policy. And this has at least three elements, which is technology markets, but policies also. 
And um, in, as I have said, policies, I think, are key. And we are looking into different levels. And this has been made very clear by Dolph and Rabia. Um, it's the local level that counts, but also the national, the regional, and the global level. And the goal is to unlock the potential to really um, create markets. Policies are also key to achieve a kind of predictability for investors, which I think is key. And also with regard to markets, it's, it's of course bringing prices down. So I think the development of regional global markets is really important and should be one goal and also to have a level playing field and, and the goal of, of markets. Um, the global level is also very important to deal with the geopolitical ramifications that we're seeing with the, geo, with the energy transformation in general, but also with the step towards a hydrogen economy. What, and this is my last point in my opening statement, is very important to see that with regard to policies, of course, we are not starting from scratch, but we are trying to um, create or develop a new system corresponding to the need of hydrogen, um, but really on the basis of an existing um, system. So we have path dependencies here as well, and this is sometimes very tricky. Thank you, Kirsten, uh, for those um, for those words, and uh, we'll, we'll get back to you soon. Uh, but first, I would like to ask um, Johannes uh, to uh, you know, introduce himself, his company, as well as some opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for having me here. I'm just um, going to say a few words about the company, where I come from, and the vantage point from, from which we log into hydrogen, renewable hydrogen. Uh, my name is Johannes Bogel. I represent Ørstad. And we're based in Copenhagen, Denmark. It's right here behind me. And um, we, uh, we are a renewable energy uh, major and the world's leading offshore wind developer. And um, 10 years ago, our core business was in fossil fuels. Uh, we were probably one of the most carbon intensive energy companies in Europe. But today our core business is in renewable energy. And um, we have a, a target of becoming fully carbon neutral in our operations by 2025. And we're already 85% there now. Um, for us, though, it's natural to look into hydrogen uh, because of a strong link to offshore wind. Uh, producing hydrogen at a large scale through electrolysis will require a, large, a really large supply of renewable power. And we develop and we own and we operate several offshore wind farms around the world. And often they're close to industrial centers when renewable hydrogen is required. And um, just to say this point that plenty of renewable energy and renewable power is a precondition for producing renewable hydrogen to decarbonize the hard to abate sectors. And um, a major game changer is the fact that renewable power production has become cost efficient. Offshore wind like solar and onshore wind is to most parts of the world available at a lower cost than new fossil fuel based power plants. And for uh, offshore winds in which we are the specialists, the, the prices and the LCOE have fallen about 70% during the last eight years. And um, one of my points today is that renewable hydrogen needs to embark on a similar uh, journey. And just saying some of the points that uh, Kirsten made about working together, the public and the private sector with the right regulatory framework, some call this the ambition loop. I think that's a really important point as well on a, on a national level in particular. Thank you. Thanks, Johannes. Um, and I would like to give the floor uh, to Carl. Uh, you work for a very interesting uh, company uh, with a very innovative uh, technology. We're looking forward to, to what you're doing. Thank you very much, Frank. And uh, it's a pleasure being here. So Karl Hopmeier, my name, I'm representing Norski Fuel, a Norwegian company um, that's a European consortium focusing on power to liquid technology. So we are a consortium of technology providers uh, looking to build up um, integrated standardized plant layouts to have a series of power to liquid facilities up and running in Norway and around Europe in the upcoming few years. I think 
regarding uh, the opening statements, um, th this is really already it. We are, by, by all definition of the means, a clean tech company that is trying to tackle uh, climate change um, and, and, more importantly, the hard to electrify and hard to, to mitigate sectors, specifically in transport, in aviation, where we see the need for liquid, um, liquid energy carriers with a high energy density and providing those in mass um, in, in a renewable manner. Now, all what has been said by, by um, the previous speakers is absolutely true. We also think that um, public-private partnerships is, is the way forward and the, the enabling factor today where we think this is really something we, we can go for in, in a sense of green hydrogen and green power to liquid in general is of course the, the reducing or, or the lower cost of renewable electricity, which is of course always the starting point. However, I, I might like to add one, one additional um, point in, into this discussion, and this is timing. I think when, when most people are discussing about 2030, 2050 targets, some think this is around the corner, most think this is still some time ahead. But let me tell you, if we're talking about industrial development regarding hydrogen and power to liquid implementation in large scale industrial projects, you have to account for the time it needs to get these projects up and running. You have two to three years of project preparation, two years of project implementation and construction. Then you have validation. Then you're up to the point where you go into large scale um, implementation. So really the time to act is today so that we have technologies ready by 2030 when it really, really counts. And as Dolph has mentioned, 300 gigawatts are required by 2030. So we better start running. Thanks, uh, Carl. Uh, that's a very clear message. Uh, but I, I would first like to be, uh, I'll get back to you uh, on that one. I'd first like to, uh, to get back to Kirsten, um, because you uh, authored a report on the international uh, dimension of, of green hydrogen policy to support uh, the scale up of, of the technology. As a, and, and you're an expert on both energy security as well as hydrogen. Um, can, can you briefly describe your view on the international uh, dimension? You, you mentioned it in your opening remarks, uh, but the international dimension of hydrogen policy and how that feeds back into uh, the national dimension. Can you, can you reflect on that? Um, that's, that's really a, a very important question, especially the part how it feeds back into the national dimension, because it's it, it really both ways. Um, and as um, Carl has said, we, we have to run and we have to start with, with policies as well. Um, the report that we, we co-authored with for other very esteemed colleagues in the Leeds Taste van der Graaf, we looked into the question whether hydrogen is the new oil. And we said that, well, of course, um, comparisons always limp, but um, with regard to geopolitics, yes, there is a truth in it because um, it will really change um, the whole um, yeah, economic system with regard also to the associated power and financial shifts and also um, associated geopolitical ramifications. So if you see it that way, it's, it's really that hydrogen is somewhat the, the new oil. And, and we think that it is very important to see that um, hydrogen is not only perpetuating existing importers exporters relations or just replicating them, but it's really a kind of systemic shift because the hydrogen value chain is much more complex. We are talking about different modules. And it, it, it's really more diverse. We're talking about diverse production and value change. Um, change also into different demand sectors. And I think this has been highlighted. So it, it's really kind of reshuffling the world order. It gives um, new chances and opportunities for all states because the ubiquity of renewables is, is there. Um, and so you can really, um, let me say it that way, reimagine nat re imagine national economies and recalibrating, so to say, the global division of labor. And I think this is really new. Um, and this um, is, of course, a challenge how to move forward and deal with that. And in, in that regard, I really think that international cooperation is key. 
Um, to highlight a very important point that also Rabia has made, it's about norms and standards. It's about certificates of origin, which I think is very important to um, start very early to look to the life cycle to have this kind of integrity for, for this commodity. And also, of course, um, timing, technology, um, and innovation are key. Um, so this is kind of the picture that we painted. And in, in final word, I mean, if you have this analogy to oil, um, let me put it that way, that I think hydrogen deserves a much more collaborative and cooperative start than we had with oil. So it's, it's really a point to look into governance issues very quickly and to engage on, on the regional and global level. And, can, and, can, you, yes. can you explain a yeah. little bit what you mean with governance issues? I mean, what, what does that mean in this context? Well, the governance issues, um, I mentioned already the certificates of origin, the norms and standards that were highlighted. I think that's very important. And then, of course, we're talking about kind of scaling and we are all looking now and, and Rabia made these four pillars with the national strategies and clusters starting or hydrogen valleys, as we say in, in Europe. But the challenge is really to connect these clusters and to scale up and to create markets. And I think this, this is a key challenge for, for really international collaboration to get markets started, to have a level playing field Field. So you have all these kind of issues of multilateralism, WTO as it's technology connected. Um, so this is what I mean with, with international governance being really something that has to go in parallel basically with the, with the national um, policy development. And, 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 and just let, let's, uh, I mean, uh, your point is of course very valid and um, we'll get back to that on the you know, the how to get there and, uh, you know, the, 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 the quality assurance and, and the governance aspect. But, but let's imagine uh, a couple of decades in the future when hydrogen is much, much bigger than it is right now. And um, uh, let's then, for example, look at, at Europe uh, or Japan, for that matter, their, their energy importers now and very likely continue to be energy importers in the future. Will a European system that's you know that, that will depend on hydrogen and green electricity, uh, but but also on imports of those, will that be more secure or will it be sort of the same? Or what is your what is your view on, on that? Because the relationships are are going to be different. They're going to change. There's probably more options, but but perhaps I I'm, I'm missing something. No, no, I, I think this was a great summary of, of what I said. Um, I, I think, yes, in, in, indeed, um, the European system, yeah, Europe will import um, again a lot in, in the future. But it is, as I said, I see it more diverse, but I would be interested um, what the colleagues think, because we, we don't have this one value chain of hydrogen. But we also have, you know, the derivatives like power to, to X, um, these fuels. So it will be very different. And to my regard, it's more upon political choice than about geology. So it's not that much about asymmetric dependencies, but really more um, based, yeah, really on, on political choice. So I, I, I think that you, you can have a more strategic approach in a sense, um, but you are asking someone coming from, you know, the, the foreign and security policy angle. So I would always argue for that, really looking into um, and partnering with first movers, partnering with countries where you have kind of the same approach to markets and rules and regulations, and then kind of in concentric circles develop or influence, well, the global market. So of course the hope is, and this would be my remark on that, and then maybe I, I hand back, that the hope of, of course is in, in Europe that Europe sets norms and standards for the world, but of course Europe is also pretty much aware that um, there are other movers uh, like China as well. So it's, it's kind of a race as well. 
Thanks. Um, you, Johannes, uh, you mentioned uh, your transformation from uh, like a coal-based uh, company to now, you know, largely renewable energy, and that's still going, going ahead further. Uh, and, and your angle is, um, you know, as you describe it, primarily from, you know, an offshore wind perspective, uh, serving clients and, and potentially different markets. But doesn't I mean if if you know you're you have a large footprint in Europe, Europe's uh, electricity is twenty percent of final energy that needs to go to fifty. So there is still so much to do in electricity. Why, why bother with hydrogen? Well, you're absolutely right. There is an enormously important task ahead of us in order to decarbonize the power sector in Europe and other places in the world. And, and then grow that. And, and, yeah. and on top of that, you grow that. Yeah, on top of that, grow that. Just uh, take something that happened today. The European Commission just uh, announced its strategy on offshore wind today. And um, there's an ambition of, uh, of having 300 gigawatts of uh, offshore wind in two, two, 2050. That's about 25 times what the capacity is today. And, um, and that, that's because we need to electrify, I mean, just as much as we can. The direct electrification is just essential. And you still need to develop the transmission capacity. I think that's just an important point to hear. I'm not going to dwell that much into that. But we also have a situation where not all sectors can be electrified directly. So I think that's very much what we are talking about here. Some will need renewable hydrogen or powers that are kind of derivatives of a renewable hydrogen, synth fuels, e fuels of different types. Carl would talk about these. And that's, that's where the renewable hydrogen and will be a major component. So um, in that way, electrification, the electrification generation and hydrogen, renewable hydrogen is just intertwined, is connected. And um, um, I think we cannot wait until uh, the power sector has become totally decarbonized before the, the society is venturing into re renewable hydrogen. I mean, um, it's, um, it will take time to scale this, to mature it. And, and more than that, we're also looking at different markets where the share of renewable power is, I mean, it differs. If you look at the north western part of Europe, there's a really high share of renewable power. If you look at other parts of the world, it's a different situation. So. Um, and the North, uh, North Sea is close to where I, I live and where my company has the headquarters. I mean, we have um, a combination of a great share of renewable, high renewable power in the system, and also uh, a really a big uh, opportunity to build out actually with a lot of offshore wind and other stuff that could make us produce much more than we actually need if it's just the direct electrification. So we could produce also the indirect, indirect electrification. So, um, and that brings me down to maybe three factors I just want to mention. I mean, uh, power to X is, uh, or, and also renewable hydrogen. I mean, it's just an essential factor if we should decarbonize our societies. And that's also, I mean, what was mentioned in the introduction uh, with Dolphin, Arabia uh, earlier. So if we should mitigate the climate change, um, and have it stay not with the temperature increase increase not above 1.5 or let alone two. I mean, we really need to decarbonize some of the heavy emitting, heavy transport, heavy um, um, industrial sectors where it's difficult to to decarbonize with by electrification. Um, and then we see this uh, renewable hydrogen and offshore wind as a perfect match. And um, and that, one of the reasons is that with the offshore wind, there's really high capacity factors. So when you have the, the turbines out at, at sea, there is actually wind quite a lot of the time. And um, that means that you can um, operate your electrolyzers most of the time and counterbalancing um, the high capex and also high opex actually, when you produce uh, renewable hydrogen. Um, and finally, sorry to bring it back to my company again, but we do believe that we do here have some of the competences with kind of the, the cost out journey that we have played an important role in. Um, I mean, a lot of uh, companies did that, but we did play an important role in, in the, the cost out journey in uh, offshore wind. And we do believe that we could take some of the same tools, measures and use it in, in bringing down the cost in, in, 
in renewable hydrogen? Well, that is something we're all waiting for, uh, Johannes. Well, one last <laughs> question. If, if you're looking at your business and, and you're, you're, uh, you're looking at uh, an increasing amount of, I mean, what was it, 300, 360 gigawatts that was announced uh, as, as yeah, 300, target. yeah. So then, then uh, you know, you're, you're all going to feed electricity more or less at the same time in a similar electricity market. How important is it, uh, you know, for you to, to, to convert some of that in and, and make a product that is in an entirely different market? So like the hedging effect of, uh, of, of hydrogen uh, in, in, in that context, how important is that for our staff? Well, I mean, of course, it's important that you can kind of counter those uh, movements in different ways. That's also where hydrogen can play an important role um, um, in order to, you can bring the hydrogen into, um, into the, the industry or into producing fertilizer and so on. So you can actually also, um, well, store it if you, if you want to do that. So that's, uh, that's definitely something that's an important aspect as well. Thank you. Uh, Carl, you, you mentioned uh, your, your company, it's, it's a fairly new company. You mentioned, uh, you know, variety of products. Can you, can you give a little bit more detail on, on, on exactly what you're doing? Certainly, um, probably not self-explanatory, I understand. Um, I think what, what we're doing is, is quite simple though, in, in general. So we basically take um, water and CO2 as, as the two feedstocks, like the, the two building blocks. And then we use electrolyzer technology to, to split those um, with, with the help of renewable electricity. And then via multiple steps, basically, and via synthesis, we recombine those, those building blocks into liquid hydrocarbons. So in the end, you basically take water, CO2, and electricity, and then you produce a hydrocarbon, which by its properties is equal to what you would know for, for diesel or jet A fuel. So when you burn that fuel and you can burn it and use it in, in the existing infrastructures and, and airplanes which exist, if you burn that fuel then, CO2 is released back into the atmosphere, but exactly the same amount that you've used in the beginning in order to produce those fuels. So in themselves, they create a carbon cycle and are carbon neutral. Um, and, and you're basically mimicking nature. That's what you're doing. You're sort of mimicking the typical process that the plant would go through, but we're doing it synthetic. So therefore more efficient and uh, hopefully in, in the future also more scalable. On, on your website, I saw that you're also looking at direct air capture. Is that, um, can, can you say a little bit more about that? Is that one, is that gonna be commercial uh, and can compete with other sources? Absolutely. I think direct air capture is, is very interesting. I think the, 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 I mean, it's highly debated, but actually the answer is quite simple. Um, that you will need CO2 as a resource. It's basically a building block in the future. It will become um, something to use because you, there are always gonna be carbon-based molecules, which you will require, which are currently fossil-based. You want to get rid of those. Now, if you are, however, decarbonizing and, and we're serious about it, and I hope, I'm very hopeful we are, then uh, sooner or later, you're gonna run out of point sources or, or emitting sources of CO2 that you can tap into. So where does your CO2 come from? It needs to come from air. Um, that's of course, the, there's development up to, to that point where, where the technology will be scalable and, and also where you can actually build it in, in those proportions and amounts. But we believe, we strongly believe that this will be uh, a necessity and therefore we are, we are pushing for this technology and want to include it right from the beginning into our processes. Now. A very interesting factor about power to liquid though, and I think this is um, what could actually very much help where direct air capture helps power to liquid and power to liquid helps direct air capture, is that if you look at the production of, of um, liquid fuels, which are electricity-based fuels, um, the sensitivity, the cost sensitivity lies with electricity and not with CO2. So if direct air capture allows you to move to locations where Electricity, electricity is abundantly available and or cheaper than it would be in, in more industrialized regions. Um, and if direct air capture allows you to go to those um, locations and therefore tap into cheaper renewable electricity resources, um, the economics actually work out. And so, so it can actually become the economically speaking right choice to deploy direct air capture compared to other solutions. Good, fascinating. So you also mentioned uh, timing, it's a race, etc. Uh, if I look at, at jet fuels, which, which is something that you're also looking at, uh, certification for that can take, you know, 10 years. Uh, can, can, you, can you reflect on that? I mean, you can race to get the product, but then if you need 
you know, certification that takes 10 years, how, how's that going to work? Yeah, I think I think this is absolutely right. And and generally speaking, I mean, it's not just certification of fuels, it's also certification of aircrafts, engines, anything that that's sort of related. Um, and and this is one of the beauties, really, which in in the, with regard to the technology which we are applying, um, as we're using the the synthesis process which we're using is in itself nothing new. What is new is really the electrolyzer, and and sort of the production and usage of green hydrogen. But the synthesis has been around since since the 1930s, 1940s. So as such, it's actually already certified within the American Society of Testing and Materials. So there is an existing ASTM norm which allows you to use those fuels um, in conjunction with with fossil jet A up to 50% drop in. So today we are capable of every liter of of power to liquid that we produce. It can be fueled directly into existing airplanes and can directly have on CO2 if, um, positive effect. Good, good stuff. So then I would like to uh, get back to Kirsten uh, and, and uh, get back to policy, which is, which is actually what, what, about, uh, what we're talking about today. Um, th there has been uh, qu quite a bit of focus in uh, the last couple of years on uh, transport, you know, hydrogen as, as a transport fuel, because there, you know, we saw that uh, we could potentially be in, in the market, uh, you know, earlier, because, you know, we pay a lot for fuels. Uh, but but now we're seeing a shift uh, more towards you know industrial applications, the, the bulk applications, whether it's in, in the refinery business or steel making or ammonia and all of those things. Are, are we are we shifting also the policy making enough and quickly enough uh, in in those sectors? Well, I I. I... <sighs> No, <laughs> I mean, we are not fast enough. We all said that timing is really crucial. And um, I think the policy challenge is really a, a very complicated and complex one, because in most countries we have, as I said, an existing institutional and policy framework, which is dedicated to our existing system. So in a, in, in a sense, the, the, the tricky thing is, um, if we are introducing hydrogen, it's to me, it's not only as um, disrupting existing structures in the techno technological sphere, but it also requires really adapting and maybe also disrupting policy um, path dependencies. And this, this is a very tricky challenge if you really look and dig into you know, the nitty gritty details of regulation. So um, it, it takes a lot of time and, and the adaption of existing policy instruments is, is um, really also time consuming. So my, my answer would be no, but we have to go anyway. So it is, it's, as quickly as possible. Um, as I said, I think policy um, changes are, are, are really key. I'm not sure whether this answers your question. It's not too well, interesting. No, but 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 no, no. I, I think your point is uh, is a valid one. That um, you know, you know, have, having a systemic change. Uh, you know, it's not just about technology. It's not just yes. about markets uh, and or infrastructure. Uh, perhaps even uh, you know the policy mechanisms need to be thought uh, freshly uh, in, instead of. You know, looking at what do we have now? How do we make small incremental steps to to the new situation? So that's a that's a valid point. Uh, Johannes, you're you're a private sector player. Um, what what is what, what would be your focus or your demand uh, in terms of uh, supportive policy for uh, the things that that you would like to do beyond you know the obvious uh, things like subsidies, etc. But what what would be your yeah. say your top three uh, in in, in in regulatory support? Well, I think um, one of our main points also from the introduction here is that companies cannot do this alone. Production side cannot do it alone. Offtake side cannot do it alone. Um, and governments cannot do it alone. I mean, we need to work together in this. And that's really what makes this difficult, complex. Um, but but, but uh, uh, sorry, your honors. I mean, every, everybody said that. Okay, sorry. Okay, so what you need to do is sounds very rosy, but what does it mean? Okay, you need to scale. I mean, you need to scale up to get the cost down. So how do you do this? How do you get the offtake, the production, to work together in frameworks where they really want to risk something, where you want to invest? Okay, um, so and you want to invest. You want to have 
I'm not as a company. We're not going to invest several billions in building uh, electrolyzer facilities if no one's going to uh, buy it on the other side. So you need these projects where you kind of grow them in parallel or in tandem, where you have the production and the offtake at the same time. So how do you do that? That's where government could play an important role to support, like um, flagship. Um, um, flagship uh, um, experiments or flagship production where you kind of grow up and see if you can turn down, uh, kind of get, get up the scale and get down the cost. So um, so that's that's the one part. So there's like three pieces in this jigsaw puzzle. The first is existing regulation. The other side is the production side where you need to kind of support that and the offtake side where you need to incentivize somehow um, the, uh, the offtake um, and that could be, for example, blending mandates for hydrogen, just to come with an example. Um, on, the, on the existing regulation, another specific example, I mean, in, in, in um, many, many markets, countries, you still pay grid charges. When you, if you produce something, you put it into the electrolyzer, although that's very close to the, uh, where the cable comes in from shore and where you're gonna use it, uh, the hydrogen but you're really not um, using the grid to a, to a very high level, but you still pay the same amount. Could you adjust that uh, grid charge, for example? So th these are some of the examples I, I would like to bring forward here. No, thanks, that's, that's very helpful. I hope that's a little more specific. <laughs> yeah, no, no, <laughs> thanks. Carl, um, why, why are you based in Norway? And, <laughs> and what are the specific advantages of, of being in Norway or being a Norwegian company? Well, well, I think there, there are a couple of reasons, really. I mean, first of all, Norway has an established infrastructure, which is well equipped for due to the exploration experience with engineers and infrastructures that allow for, for growth and development of this sort of projects, which we are looking at. Um, it has a favorable capital market, but most importantly, I think this is actually what, what you're probably aiming at is um, it has a lot of access to renewable electricity with additional capacity. So it's from a, from a market perspective, Norway has been at the forefront of adapting renewable solutions also in transport sectors. So, it, so it's a natural point to start, but it's not just for the Norwegian markets, really for the development of an industry and for further scaling, which would allow also to export from Norway towards the European market, uh, which Norway has access to in Europe being on, on the forefront of implementing power to liquid um, power to liquid developments, at least as we currently see it in, in the political framework. So in that sense, um, I think there, there are a lot of good reasons um, to, to start in Norway, at least uh, for us as a company. And how, I mean, how does, you know, the, the public private uh, aspect of these developments uh, play out for you? I mean, how important is that? How does that work in Norway? Well, I think um, what, basically this comes a bit back to, to what Johannes has said. Um, we, we are in a situation where what, what we really need to, to some extent is uh, security for investors. Right, we we're just discussing capital intensive industry, which needs to scale in order to bring costs down. But how do you how do you do this in the beginning? And this is really where public private um, basically partnerships can come in. And this can be subsidy schemes, this can be market incentives, this can be securities, access to to cheap uh, funding and financing. Um, and I think this is this is what is important. Norway. In itself, I would I would say even if Norway is not part of the EU, it's following most of the regulations. So in that sense, I would actually talk about Europe and and say that they are uh, they they are projects now coming up. There's green the Green Deal um, basic initiative. There's a lot of um, discussions regarding quotas on on refuel aviation, for example. Um, there is the ETS Innovation Fund scheme, which is directly focusing on on getting basically technologies out of out of the valley of death really to a commercial level um, and of course there are nat national schemes as well and support schemes so I think it's it's really the the big bundle and and you can you can name a variety of numbers of of helpful in incentivizing um, policies but really what it all boils down to is you need to have security for investors so you either need to create a separate market for these power to liquid fuels, which are a bit more, uh, which are more expensive than fossils, or you need to address the cost gap. And of course, in, in the intermediate moments, exactly in the beginning, 
um, we're tackling high capital costs for initial projects, having capital support there as well is, is absolutely crucial. Thanks. And, um, you know, we have time for, I think, one, one last quick question. Uh, I would like all of you to, to briefly reflect on the price of carbon. We haven't really uh, dis discussed that much, but, uh, but how uh, does that tie into, uh, let's say, the next 10 years? Maybe Kirsten first. Well, I think this is ex extremely important because we are talking, of course, about at least from the European side in implementing the, the Green Deal. The, the question is um, um, not to have carbon leakage and at the same time um, maintain our competitiveness. So, yeah, we need kind of support schemes plus for the difference also really yeah, a price for carbon. And I think it, it, we will have to look into partnerships where partners also price on, on carbon. So this is the, the aim of governance as well. Well, you, you mentioned Europe, uh, you know, of course there's the emissions trading system, which is not, you know, entirely, you know, really fit for, for hydrogen. Do you, do you think we need something specific for hydrogen? Maybe I can ask Hans or Carl. Carl, you're nodding. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. I think, um... Basically, basically, I'm going to say something now, which is probably not, not not the most common view. But I don't think you're gonna you're gonna solve this issue with a price for carbon, because the issue you have with the pricing or carbon taxations, for example, which is typically being discussed, it's usually people discuss starting low and then increasing it over time. However, what you're having, specifically if you're looking at hydrogen and hydrogen technology development, you're having a technology which needs to scale down in cost. So basically, you have very high cost today, and in the future you think that you're going to be cost competitive. So those two, those two don't really match together. So even if you implement carbon prices, you would have to implement carbon prices, which are so high today in order to get uh, the electrolyzer technology into the market, um, that it's not politically feasible. I'm not saying carbon taxes are bad or, or carbon prices. I think they're very, very important um, to drive a lot of initiatives, which are as important as, as we've seen as well, which is, for example, um, efficiency and, and carbon reduction in, in your processes in general. However, it's not going to help um, hydrogen and, and or powder liquid facilities. So really, if you're looking at those parts, what you need is separate markets where those technologies can develop in competition, but not in competition to fossil alternatives. Or you need to address the cost gap, which is given um, between, between basically renewable solution and the fossil solution that they're competing against. And obviously, within uh, in, in the European hydrogen strategy, there's a, a suggestion for carbon contracts for difference to to bridge that that gap. Uh, Johannes, um, any any last word before we uh, go to the next part of the agenda? Uh, just a single fast one. I think um, Kirsten is mentioning the ETS and uh, the leakage question is today. Some of the companies that are exposed to international competition get these ETS for free. But if you get it from the renewable hydrogen, you, you usually don't get it. So it kind of, it's kind of a counterproductive to what we're trying to do here. So there's definitely a regulatory issue here for the EU to look into. Thanks, very clear and very short. Thank you. Uh, and, and with that, I would like to uh, now uh, go uh, to the country interventions. I would like to um, ask the uh, EU delegation, uh, Mr. Ruth Kempener, uh, I guess you're in Brussels, Ruth. Uh, to give the, the floor. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Frank. Thank you very much, uh, panelists. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I quickly wanted to use this opportunity to, in a couple of words, uh, introduce the European hydrogen strategy, which was indeed launched on, on in July uh, this year. Uh, and I'm glad that some of the panelists in this question already, already mentioned the, the strategy. And the first point which I wanted to, to highlight, and I think that also came through in the presentation from, from Arena, is that the hydrogen strategy was launched uh, at the same time as the strategy for energy system integration. Um, so the, the European Commission at least tried to, uh, to look at this at a, from a very holistic perspective, uh, looking at the direct use of renewables, electrification, and also renewable uh, and low carbon fuels, including hydrogen, uh, in order to get to our uh, objective of climate neutrality. And these two strategies very much work in parallel. So looking at the options and how they interrelate to, with one another, 
and also specifically where hydrogen brings the added value because we know we need it uh, if we want to achieve our objectives of 2050. Uh, the second part, what the, what the hydrogen strategy does is to, at an EU level, set some, some objectives. Um, we want to achieve uh, the production of 1 million ton of renewable hydrogen in 2024 and 10 million ton in 2030. And to give you some sense of, of scale, this, this equates to about 10% of existing fossil-based uh, hydrogen consumption in the EU for 2024, and about 100% uh, of the, the, the fossil-based fossil hydrogen consumption in 2030. Uh, the strategy doesn't set any, any targets for 2050, um, also because, of course, the, the, the scale of development we expect will, will be rapidly increasing after 2030, but it clearly puts a, a kind of a long-term priority for renewable hydrogen uh, because it sees three reasons for that. Uh, first of all, as was indicated also by, uh, by Dr. Dolph Gielen, the cost competitiveness in the long term. Um, secondly, uh, the compatibility with uh, the future energy system, and thirdly, of course, the compatibility with our climate neutrality objectives. Um, the strategy also, um, and I think this was a very important exercise, uh, allowed uh, within the European Commission at least to bring different director generals. So these are essentially our ministries together. Because if you look at hydrogen, it's not sufficient to look only at energy policy. You also have to look at climate policy, you have to look at transport policies, and you have to look at industrial policies. And so from that perspective, the hydrogen strategy looks at four big, big areas of policy making. And the one area is need support for production and consumption of renewable hydrogen. And here indeed, it's very important. One of the important elements is the certification. Um, the EU has 27 uh, member states uh, and already there are streams of hydrogen from one member state to the other. So for the EU itself already, it's very important to have certification in place and allow consumers to differentiate the different forms of renewable and low carbon hydrogen. And the second policy area is infrastructure uh, and the creation of markets. Um, here, actually, the creation of a hydrogen market is something which is completely new. We have hydrogen consumption, but very of that is traded on the market. Um, and here we really uh, are looking for a step-by-step -step, uh, approach and kind of learning while doing. Uh, and we clearly see that in a very short period, uh, short-term period up to 2024, there is really need to look indeed at industrial applications as one of those key areas where we have to start with building infrastructure and creating markets around that. Uh, the third area is research and innovation. Uh, 900 million euros have been spent by the European Commission over the last decade uh, on the development of electrolyzers, fuel cells, etc. Uh, but we see the continuous need for innovation also across the value chain. So not only production uh, and, and consumers, but also transmission and storage. Um, and then last but not least, of course, one of the key priorities in the European strategy is international cooperation. Uh, because uh, also from an EU perspective, we we'll clearly see that this uh, is necessary to achieve EU objectives. Um, and then from that perspective, of course, we're honored to chair the uh, collaborative framework on green hydrogen within IRENA. And last but not least, I would then also like to invite you to uh, join us for an event which we are organizing together with the UAE uh, on the 25th of November to indeed discuss this topic and the strategies in an international perspective. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thanks, Ruth, and also thanks for that last uh, comment. Uh, indeed, uh, we hope that all, all the people that are here today will also join us next week to have a focus, indeed, on, on uh, Europe and, uh, and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and yeah, I think it's also fair to say, I mean, that the, the panelists uh, mentioned uh, that it's a race we have to hurry up, and Europe is certainly hurrying up six years, it was in 2024. It's a lot compared to where we are now. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, ask or invite the uh, uh, delegation of uh, Italy, uh, Mr. Gilberto Di Luce, who is Director General for Energy Security and Infrastructures uh, at the Ministry of Economic Development. Uh, I'm really excited to, to learn more about what, what uh, Italy is doing, because I think there's some uh, announcement uh, today, I believe. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, for giving, thanks for giving me the floor and for inviting me to this very interesting meeting uh, uh, about the hydrogen policies. Uh, 
yes, let me thank uh, also again because uh, uh, we can take this opportunity of this meeting and to announce uh, that Italy is going to publish uh, this national strategy for hydrogen. It's not yet a full strategy bus uh, document, uh, including all the guidelines for the public consultation uh, that will last uh, one month, uh, thus giving us the opportunity to define the full document uh, to be adopted uh, by our government. Uh, this document includes some um, targets possible as some different achievements we can have in the hydrogen policies. And obviously it is uh, full compliant with the European Union uh, targets and strategies that my colleagues from European Union just mentioned. And in line with these targets, uh, uh, according also our national plan for energy and climate, that is one of the pillars for the Italian decarbonization path, uh, aiming at developing an environmental strategy up to 2030 in coherence with the EU's previous target. Uh, we also outline the role of hydrogen in achieving the above national targets and identifies the potential application of hydrogen in a number of energy sectors, for example, the transport sector with fuel cell trucks and trains, outlining 1% penetration target in the renewable fuels transport and also the management of electricity regeneration with hydrogen storage application. Uh, according to our views, hydrogen is uh, positioned uh, to contribute to a national environmental targets and to a more secure and reliable energy production, uh, especially if produced with renewable energy sources. Uh, in particular, hydrogen can play a double role for our country in the long run, up to 2050. Uh, it can also help in the decarbonation effort in the so-called hard to abate sector. Uh, for uh, in our strategy, uh, we are considering that the long haul track segment is one of the heaviest emitting sectors, accounting for uh, fifty. 5 to 10 percent of our transport and currently uh, the regulatory landscape for the transport sector is evolving uh, with concrete action towards the carbonization uh, setting new emission standards for the manufacturers and also for the train uh, another right sector of interest uh, is the railway sector in particular the passenger railway transport uh, in Italy approximately one third of railways uh, are dedicated to diesel trains and, and fuel cell trains can become a cost competitive with diesel trains option in the next decade. And therefore, uh, they will be one of the most providing sector uh, in which to, to kickstart uh, the uh, development of the national hydrogen market. Hydrogen can also have to decarbonize the heart of the sector, uh, characterized by energy intensity and lacking scalable electrification process. Uh, two of them uh, we are considering are the chemical products uh, and the oil refining sector that are already using the gray hydrogen. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we can use the, the, uh, the network for the gas transport. We in Italy have already developed uh, uh, covering the whole territory. Also uh, for the possibility to have the blending of hydrogen, just to start to kick off a market for hydrogen produced and the blending low carbon hydrogen or in the future, uh, green hydrogen uh, can be an effective way to contribute to the carbonization targets and to stimulate uh, the hydrogen market uh, while investing in the supply chain. And we are considering to use the overgeneration from renewables to produce green hydrogen that in the first phase could be also uh, injected into the network uh, for blending at the lower cost. And the further application we are studying is the aviation and the maritime transport uh, that in the long term could be an interesting market also for hydrogen based solution together with biofuels. And also uh, in the uh, power generation sector, hydrogen could play an important role to enable a better integration of intermittent energy sources uh, such as renewables and the excess power from renewables can be turned into hydrogen to be further employed as fuel in turbine based backup power generation. Uh, 
uh, so with low efficiency. Uh, so such hydrogen can be uh, used in uh, in some places. We are also considering uh, to establish some hydrogen ballets and also to promote in Italy some uh, internal uh, Jaga factory to start and to scale up for the electrolyzer sector. Uh, so we'll start soon uh, the consultation next week. Uh, we'll send also this document to Irina, to our colleagues, uh, just to also have to their, their comments on this. Uh, so we, uh, you, we also are waiting for your observation, your comment to help us to define the final strategy. Thanks for the attention. Yes, th thank you very much. Uh, and we're really looking forward to that. And we'll make sure that we will respond uh, and give uh, feedback. Uh, before I give the floor to Denmark, uh, I would like to uh, note that uh, any IRENA member state, please raise your hand if you would like to contribute with a targeted uh, uh, contribution. Um, just um, uh, raise your hand in the chat box and I will make sure that you get the floor. Uh, but I would like to invite um, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador Franz Michael Melbin uh, uh, to uh, address uh, this meeting. Thank you very much, and I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, and I'd like to thank the, the uh, former speakers for excellent presentations and a, a great discussion. Uh, I'm going to focus a little on this, what, what policymakers can do and, and what our role can be in all this. And I'll do that in, in two dimensions. One is what are the tools that are at our disposal? Uh, there is a real issue with time to market. There's a real issue because competing technologies are also developing. And uh, an example of that is, is uh, the automobile market could have been a excellent uh, uh, case for, for blending and, and you sort of get that into, we did that with biofuels to a certain extent. Uh, but of course, battery technology and electrification seems to be a much more likely candidate as things have developed technologically. So when we look at, at how to kickstart a market and, and maybe using blending, I think there are dilemmas here that policymakers will be challenged by, and that is that blending will typically be blending with carbons. You take green hydrogen and you blend it up with uh, black carbon, so to say. And that is not a very attractive uh, solution per se, because it, it keeps uh, supporting a carbon-based uh, production or infrastructure or, or, or whatever. And, and these kind of dilemmas uh, are there for policymakers. And I, I just want to highlight them because you hear a lot about blending and I understand why the, the industry looks at blending as a good opportunity, but, but there are drawbacks if we go that way uh, because the hydrogen market also has this time to market issue. This is the real challenge. But what technologies would be available 10 years from now and which of the existing blending options will actually be relevant if we look 10, 15 years down the line uh, and nobody wants to sink into to, to costs. The other thing and the other dimension I think is very important uh, to at least consider as a, a possibility when we talk about hydrogen. And this again is, is somewhat linked to time to market. That is that the renewable energy transformation is happening very rapidly. And uh, I, I don't entirely agree with those who may feel that that we will not uh, be able to escape this dependency asymmetry when it comes to energy markets. I think that the cost factor, the, the, the falling cost factor of renewables will lead to a situation where all countries in effect will want to have uh, energy self-sustainability and independence. Also because we will find price equivalence uh, in the longer run. So, so everybody will be able to make cheap uh, renewable and they will be able to do it in, in large, on a large scale. And when you do that, you get this uh, situation where the marginal price of electricity converges towards zero. There's a cost, of course, nothing is for free, not even marginal electricity, but the, the, the price converges towards zero. 
and everybody will be able to input into to hydrogen production or whatever they want to do uh, from, from there on, or P2X or whatever the, 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 the outlets would be for, for this uh, zero priced uh, electricity production. So these things play together and they especially play together as actors, industry actors as we have today, uh, they sort of look forward and, and what's worth investing in, etc. Uh, so what, what we probably will see is that the regional policies will very much determine what will be possible to do with hydrogen. And here, uh, I do believe Europe, you know, if we want to go down the hydrogen way, the Danish government wants to go down the hydrogen way. We see we have an ambitious Italian colleague here. I know Germany also has a hydrogen strategy. The Dutch have, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, a lot of countries in Europe see this as a great opportunity. Uh, then the, the, the most likely path that I see moving forward is not that we get a globalized hydrogen market necessarily, but that regional uh, actors will drive this forward. And here the EU and, and uh, our pan-European policy to incentivize producers and, and uh, the, the, the industry seems to me to be the only viable way forward uh, on a realistic scale because we, we really need to move on this. It needs to go fast uh, so that hydrogen just doesn't lose out it's, it's competitive edge to other technologies. It's, it's not just gonna happen. It would be a great mix, we need it, and Denmark wants it. Thank you very much. Thank you for those inspiring words, and uh, I couldn't agree more to uh, your last point about uh, the speed, because the quicker we do it, actually the quicker it gets cheaper. Um, and last, but certainly not least, I would like to uh, invite Mr. Paolo Partidario, uh, who is senior researcher at the uh, General Directorate of Energy and Geology uh, in, in Portugal. Um, uh, Mr. Paulo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so it is a pleasure. Thank you very much for this invitation. It is a pleasure to uh, present uh, insights about our national strategy. It was published in August 2014, uh, of this year. Uh, the challenge is uh, to implement a sustainable integration of uh, hydrogen in the economy by evolving sectors, vectors, and infrastructures, by addressing cost reductions along cyclic value chains, and by effective integration of uh, the, all, all this is within the National Energy, climate, uh, uh, energy and Climate uh, Plan. That is a process that is ongoing till <clears throat> 2030. It is also uh, important for us the, by setting these targets until the uh, hydrogen targets until 2050, that the, the strategy represents uh, uh, that is an opportunity for, for the country by uh, uh, implementing uh, green hydrogen based value chains uh, according to the, 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 the country's needs where favorable and unique conditions exist to develop hydrogen national wide. That includes as well uh, the established and the modernized natural gas infrastructures that will be uh, uh, retrofitted uh, uh, gradually by competitive renewable energy production prices and uh, uh, also the strategic geographical location that uh, is a facilitator of exports. Um, so basically we have national commitments around uh, hydrogen from an European-wide uh, perspective and also international-wide. Uh, European, uh, in, Europe, in Europe, uh, it's important to uh, uh, focus as well on the IPCI project initiatives that will give the chance to the country to uh, accelerate new projects, uh, integrating variable renewable energy in the national energy system, among other national policy goals. So it's also facilitated for other, other purposes. And it also will contribute at the end of the day uh, to the European strategic objectives. It is also uh, an opportunity to reinforce the international collaboration cooperation uh, with other um, countries and uh, 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 associations like uh, and agencies like IRENA namely to explore synergies in, on the basis of experience being developed along this national uh, strategy, and such is the case of the enabling framework that is one of uh, the main building blocks. Within that uh, enabling framework, we could uh, stress it is uh, 
uh, addressing both the production side, the distribution, transport, as well as storage. And in that sense, we have the regulatory conditions that are being put in place, including on renewable gases, to be ready for the short-term uh, projects, pilot projects that are uh, uh, starting being proposed uh, by uh, companies and uh, research uh, institutes and university. This is also uh, within this enabling framework, it is the case of the standardization activities where companies have regular practices. We also have been put, uh, we have put in place a, sch a scheme on guarantees of origin for green hydrogen, other renewable gases and low carbon gases. Uh, we have also uh, a plan till 2030 to install uh, nectarizing capacity up to two gigawatts approximately. Uh, that, that will be uh, um, mainly uh, based on large and small projects in different regions. So we are focusing not just on centralized, but also distributed systems. And um, so we have as well, um, we are promoting uh, learning effects in the different value chains. That is a bit in line, this is in line with the, the pilot projects that I have mentioned before, and where uh, technology readiness, unit costs on production consumption, market availability will be key issues. There's also running a uh, first uh, uh, result of, uh, we're exploring the, the next stages of a first call for projects and uh, this, is, this will be an initiative on an annual basis. And this year in July 2020, uh, a first public call uh, of expressions of interest was launched uh, based on 74 proposals submitted by partnerships that included the industry, research centers, and, and others. Uh, 37 expressions of interest were selected to go to the next stage. And that will involve in global about seven to nine billion euros approximately in terms of investment from the companies until 2030 to which 30 million euros of public investment should be added also auctions are being designed uh, focusing specifically on hydrogen and storage to support temporary capex and opex in order to promote hydrogen production public investment will represent on that state till 2030 around 200 million euros there's also a commitment on the promotion of R&D, uh, R&I involvement, environment, where a collaborative laboratory is addressing hydrogen production and use technologies. And uh, for that, we also have a participation, a participation, a strong participation from companies, universities, and research centers. And last but not the least, a task force is being launched to assist and monitor this over this process in an overall perspective. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, and um, yeah, I think Portugal has, uh, has set a pretty uh, solid benchmark with uh, the, the recent results of uh, the very low cost uh, solar project. And, and I think you, you've got a, a great position uh, to also champion uh, the hydrogen uh, story. Uh, we have a few minutes. Um, let, let's uh, try to take a few questions. Uh, there's one question uh, that uh, addresses the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is, um, you know, how Europe uh, tries to, um, uh, you know, avoid carbon leakage uh, through imports. Uh, and, and the question is, that is obviously a stick. Uh, will there be a carrot? Uh, my, my question is, uh, who would like to, uh, to take that question? I mean, will Europe also then potentially, um, you know, support uh, lower carbon initiatives in, in uh, developing countries, which is, um, you know, which may be adversely affected by a carbon uh, border tax? I don't mind to start. Uh, there's, uh, from the EU perspective, there's a challenge for the EU member countries uh, to avoid carbon leakage. So there's a, a, a huge target about uh, getting uh, production from a decentralized perspective. It doesn't mean that uh, we don't need to uh, address uh, transition processes depending on the country's needs. So that's something that should be uh, managed case by case. As far as Portugal is concerned, our main focus is on green hydrogen 
and we feel that uh, this should be part of uh, the discussion, especially about the efforts on investments. If uh, the car uh, dioxide, carbon dioxide management process will not be uh, enough balanced. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kirsten. Uh, I'm not sure you, you, you have you looked into the World Trade Organization aspects of uh, carbon border adjustment. No, I'm not a specialist on that, to be honest. Then, uh, then. <laughs> I won't ask you the question, Carl. There's one one last question before I think we have to uh, uh, we have to wind down. What is the cost of power to liquid facilities? <laughs> well, that that is a question that depends on so many outside factors. There's there's really no good answer to that. I I'm afraid. I think it's it's much easier to tell you what what the cost of power to liquid production can be in balancing out scale of of power to liquid facilities and and electricity cost. Um, so, so if that's going to help, happy, happy to give it, to give that a shot. So, generally speaking, you would be looking at at ranges, of course, depending on electricity price as the main cost driver. Um, and usually, you would say power to liquid um, will be in in the intermediate term somewhere in the range of um, two to four euros per per liter if if you're in earnest production. But in the medium term, two to longer uh, longer term um, production cost can go down as low as as one euro per liter. Um, getting lower than that then, then becomes difficult um, because, of course, electricity will still cost something, um, even though we, we see a decline in electricity costs and you still always have the capital costs which you need to, to gather back. But this is generally the range that, that can be expected. Thank you. And um, perhaps now back to Rabia. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, that was a very animated discussion. I think you were the best. You've been holding the flag of, of green hydrogen for quite a few years, so I think you deserve to moderate it. <laughs> uh, thank you very much to uh, all the experts who, were, uh, who provided really interesting insight. I myself have learned a lot because I'm a beginner in the field. Um, I'd like to also thank um, the team behind the report that is being launched next Tuesday at the event uh, that was mentioned earlier by, by Ruud and, and I think Frank. Um, uh, so I'd like to thank Emanuele Bianco, Diala Hawila, Ab, uh, Abu, uh, Abdullah Abu Ali, sorry, Sofian Diab, Diab and also a few colleagues in, uh, in Bonn. So thank you very much for all the hard work for the webinar and for the report. I just want to mention that following this brief that we, we will be launching, we will have a, a series of policy briefs. One will be on the supply side, uh, one on industry and one on long haul transport. So uh, we will definitely meet again to discuss uh, each of these briefs and uh, we hope that you'll be many as you have been today. So you were asking Frank, we were 460. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. And on behalf of Irina, uh, I would like to invite you next week on the 30th of November, where we'll be launching the heating and cooling policies together with our partners, uh, REN21 and IEA in this publication. And uh, thank you again for being with us. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.